Howdy Whatnots, it's Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024, sup Pete? What's up, buddy? It's a, I'm very excited it's 2024 because when we get jerseys from teams, they give us 23, and you know I'm well known for this across North America, my favorite number is 24. Mm, my favorite number is 25, so oh. we could have a, a big few years ahead of us. But uh, it's been a big 2024 already. Canada's lost the World Juniors. Yeah. <laughs> who, are yeah. The, the, who are the favorites? Is it Sweden now? I don't Sweden, know. Sweden, USA? I've I've been lightly on the World Junior train. Uh, I'm, I am I love the World Juniors. I'm usually very, very invested in it. We've just done so much hockey this year that, like, the, over this the course of, like, the last week and a half, I've been, like, taking a step back a little bit. Plus, don't want to get into this, but... It's been a big few weeks for Texas and getting ready for Texas and their game last night in the college football playoff. Yeah. I what, wanted what to be game. like, we start with college football. Because, like, seriously, that is yeah, what's I on know. both Insane of our brains. Insane game last night. Unfortunately, a tough one as a Texas guy. Uh, it's It makes me feel like a, the season was great, and it makes me feel a little bit good that they played Pretty poorly last night and still had a chance there at the end. They got pretty lucky with the injury. Mm, get uh, him next week. Giving him, yeah, giving him a heartbeat. But man, Michael Penix Jr. is nasty. Nasty. Penix. It's pronounced penis. It's, it's Penix. Do you say Penix so when someone corrects you, yeah. <laughs> they say penis like I did? Or so they say... I just think it's funny that his name is Penix. I have been saying with friends all year, being like, well, they can just draft the penis fellow. <laughs> yeah. Watch. And then like... I'm also a big uh, put some respect on the person's name, like learn how to say a person's name right, pronounce it correctly. Not when it's that close to penis. I watched like the first five minutes of the game last night, and I was like, no more penis jokes. Penis man is him. <laughs> yeah. He's so fucking good. He is so good. Throwing lasers. Also, Quinn Ewers, certainly not Horrible. his best game. Um, the, I, I still think that like that. That final play. Well, first of all, the first down call by Sark on the on the final drive, uh, unbelievable. Everybody terrible. in real time, Seinfeld clip. What the fuck are you doing? You stupid yeah. piece of shit. Like it, you could potentially lose. You have game four ends, shots. Yeah, you have four shots at the end zone on that in that final drive. Uh, if you screw up that first down call and it does not go, if it goes sideways. You've taken all of the other shots off the board. You've lost the game. What if he found it's, a what if he found a lane to the end zone and he fucking goes for it and gets taken down at the two? Then the game's over. Insane call in that spot. Just an absolutely galaxy brain call from Sark. That will haunt me. Uh, but also I think that that final throw, the final play with one second on the clock, if you get a better throw from Quinn Ewers there, hmm. I think it's a touchdown. Like I think that Phoenix would have made that made that play. Like you you throw a little bit more zip on that ball and then get him a little bit lower in the corner of the end zone and you got a touchdown there. You win the game, you're on to the national championship. I'm also uh I, I can't like yell at kids on Twitter and be like, God damn it. Like, oh I fucking hate Jaden Blue. Like I I hate Jaden Blue. The guy's a fucking child. <laughs> he just had a bad game. But I was getting some of those moments with certain players. I'm not gonna name names. But yeah. uh, I was getting certain moments, uh, that, that feeling with certain uh, players. We got Stinger out because uh, today is a Zach Wierenski episode. Multiple time, two-time NHL All-Star defenseman Zach Wierenski. The apple of my 2015 eye for the Boston Bruins. That was like, it was my second to last year covering the team. And I actually had to pay attention to the draft back then. And I was like, Zach. Zach Wierenski is your guy. Mm. I assumed they were going to still have Dougie Hamilton. 
But I was like, just get like there's three good defensemen in this draft. Just take one of those three, please, and make it Zach Wierenski because Provorov and Hannafin will probably go ahead of him. Obviously, they end up making a million trades, so they have a bunch of picks. I remember talking to Kirk Ludicky, who's like a scouting god, and he was like, you know what? Maybe they're doing it because they want to make sure they can get Zach Wierenski, and maybe they have to trade like a couple of these picks to move up. And I was like, fuck. Yeah, but I guess if you get Zach Wierenski, it's all worth it. Love that guy. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. Really good player. Uh, really good interview. Uh, had a lot of fun. All the all the interviews that we got from Columbus are are awesome. This is the second of three, and uh, I think you think that the third one is your favorite, the one uh, that we've yet to. Yeah, well, it's it's just uh, I'm I'm a charm guy. I like to <laughs> charm. I like being charmed. I like uh, coming out of something being like, hey, that person's charming. I like the cut of their jib. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to know a little more about them. Uh, but Wierenski was always a target for this, and he was awesome with us. We're going to get to him in a little bit. An update on the missing uh, Pro Shop Wars uh, oh. memory card that contains all the stuff for the Columbus Pro Shop Wars. Still not Fuck. found. <laughs> I, I thought you were giving me a surprise. So that was just a, a, not an update. It was not yeah. an update. It's the it, same. So I would get in arguments with this uh, with other writers back in the day. Like if, if there were negotiations between like a team and a player, and you were to check in and be like, hey, they haven't made any progress. I would report that. And then people would be like, oh, cool update scoops. <laughs> Nothing like so the, the news is there's no news. I'm like, yeah, that is news. If there's a deadline to get this thing done and nothing has changed. I, I think that there can be non-update updates. Not yeah, in this I case. I agree, but I don't think. Yeah, I don't yeah think not in this <laughs> case, because like you're you're not really like working towards something there's no other side here there's a deadline I, I, there is a deadline but i'm the, the but, one that edits but there's the, no the, pro shop wars so if i die i'm gonna die at some point <laughs> we're working towards a deadline there's no other side though like if, if nothing changes from your end you don't need to report the update the only update we need is that you found it yeah i would say i don't think i don't I, know if, i would say at this point the assumption is, is, is that lost. it's lost yeah. forever whereas in the tense of a contract negotiation the end goal is always assumed to be they will get to a contract. So them not having any progress towards a contract is an update. Whereas here, lost the SD card, assume it's lost forever. So you coming in being like, we have an update. There's nothing. I know, especially like first thing <laughs> on a Monday. It's tease. not even a Monday, but like a Tuesday, first show of the week. It's It, it really felt like you were itching to, to, to drop that one. You think if I found that, I would have not told <laughs> you guys? Well, that was my image. I would that have like, was my crashed a fire truck into your homes. <laughs> that was like, uh, my first thought was, I can't believe he's being so nonchalant about having found the SD card. Right. But it's um, like the only horrible, horrible thing happening in our lives that that SD card does. Exist. And I'll tell you, by the way, every time I reach into like a new place that I like, if I'm like driving, and, you know, like the little there's like a weird crevice that's Between on the side, the yeah. like on the left of the drive, like on the door that nothing could possibly fit in there. There's no I'll be driving and I'll just like put my hand there and my heart will stop. I'll be like, I did, I haven't checked here. Maybe <laughs> it's here. And it's not like I, I when I put my hand into the stinger head, I was like, oh, my God, I haven't checked here. It's not anywhere. We do need to establish a deadline for the SD card recovery. Because that will be the point in which we can start wearing the stuff that we got from the pro shop. Fair. We also discussed what do we do if it isn't found. And we agreed that we don't want to do some like half-assed, hey, this is Pro Shop Wars. We're at the studio holding up the stuff we got. Pro Shop Wars always needs to bang. But this came up with a friend. What if we just recast Pro Shop Wars, asked some Blue Jackets players, sent them pictures of the stuff we got, be like, hey... Could you get like Kirill Marchenko to play DJ and Johnny Gaudreau to play Pete? Go around and we'd also ask Todd, the uh, Blue Jackets media relations guy, to like cast himself as well. <laughs> Just be like, could you Helping get Elvis out. to play you? And who's playing Sean? Uh, I don't think. I think. <laughs> Look at that roster. I think you might be in for a social media nightmare. If you <laughs> <pass me. laughs> is, is all white guys, I'm saying. 
Interesting. Uh, <laughs> Social media night. So now we spend the rest of the show discussing, but who would the funniest one be? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, I mean, I don't know how real we want to get like Blue Jackets broadcast team. True. Bring back Seth Jones. Yeah. Oh, Seth Jones. You'd be like, hey, could you trade for Seth Jones for this? Just F- for this. Funny part of the uh, the pro shop wars that I don't think we're. Should I tell the story about you almost buying a Seth Jones merchandise at the pro shop war? Yeah, there was. They had uh, they had like used players stuff there. Yeah. And they had a Seth Jones glove that was what, like three hundred dollars? One glove, not a pair of Seth Jones gloves. Yeah, a guy that doesn't play there anymore. One Seth Jones glove, game used for like three hundred dollars, and you came so close to getting it. That would be if they didn't have other cool stuff. This is what sucks about the SD card. I hope one of you guys found it, find it, because I th- I think you guys lost it. Um, I uh no, it's it, a thousand percent lost on my end. But um, I thought that we were going to go into that being like other than Sean we're not really crazy about mm-hmm. CBJ's branding there's not going to be anything to find a good if we out. couldn't find anything there I probably would have been like $300 Seth Jones glove whatever <laughs> it's not like I'm getting anything else we at the like when it was my turn to grab my stuff I was doing some oh wait Sean hold on oh sorry let's run back over here because like, like no I didn't I took like a minute total no, no you took forever I went after you but I took like a minute but I ran around. Mm, well, agree to disagree. But. No, no, for sure. Because you went first. I did go first. But yeah. you, you took a while. I didn't take forever. I don't think. I think you took as long as Pete did. Like, I think you took. I Pete that was, was talking like, to Todd for a while. That was a very important tiebreaker. <laughs> I was like, if Sean came in with like. DJ kind of took a while. I was. I, be I definitely don't think it was like quick by any means. Yeah, but it, it was. I, it was running around, but it like I wasn't. I wasn't fucking around. But that was that was also like we we had our like scouting period. That is and true. And he took a long time during your shopping period. Like we had a pre scouting because you both went in at the same yeah. time and went and got all your stuff. Or yeah, like figured out what you're gonna get. I can't now. I really want to find that because <laughs> yeah, I do. The thing about silly people like me is people think that, like, at least in my case, that, like, I'm not self-conscious because, like, I do these ridiculous things and everything. Like, I am so fucking self-conscious that I can't stop thinking about Like, if, if I were taking long, I for sure would have, like, started, like, sweating it out and feeling bad. I don't know. We'll find the card at some point. I don't think you took long. Like, I had a nice yeah. little conversation with Todd and you said you took, you took too forever. Long. You did take forever. I don't think I took forever. <laughs> I okay. think it's. I think this is one of those things where it takes a while. Like you, you spend, it, it's, spend it's, a, a, it's a big decision, and uh, I'm 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 sad that we don't have the the footage. So yet um, we had a yeah. swing in time yesterday though for the Winter Classic. Oh yeah, watched ourselves a great game. The Kraken are just the hottest team in the NHL. <laughs> They're the they own the first link of the chaos chain. The chaos chain has officially begun. It began with the Winter Classic. Uh, we had a nice little fun watch along stream. It mm-hmm. was it was chaotic. Yep. It was uh we had some technical difficulties. We had some uh injuries. bodily injuries. Yep. You you sliced your finger open. Mm-hmm. But we had some awesome guests. We had Sarah Siv on. She was great. She was very concerned when you sliced your finger open. Um she very helped nice. kind of Google and help us through making a delicious sandwich. We also had Zach Dalpy on. He shared an incredible story. An incredible story about uh, a night out with Jeff Skinner in which they shot Nerf guns with Ed Sheeran and FaceTimed Elton John. That's on our social channels right now. So if you want to go subscribe to the YouTube, also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff, What Chaos Show, everywhere except for TikTok, which is just What Chaos. But yeah, we put up the reel of him sharing that show. That story is absolutely worth a watch. And I, I must say, really, really must, imp- must impress must impress this upon listeners strongly if you're listening on spotify apple podcasts wherever you may be subscribe to the youtube channel i always i think that both of us kind of just assume because we're doing this and we do it live and it goes out to youtube that everybody who's consuming it is doing on you it on youtube i'm not saying only consume us on youtube i am saying subscribe because there's going to be 
supplementary content on there anyway. And if like you're listening, if this is like the first episode you're listening to, and you don't want to go back and listen to all the old episodes, you can just jump on the YouTube, watch select interviews like Connor Bedard, Brad Marchand, whoever it may be. And uh, we've got more fun stuff coming there. We've got a big like late January, February planned in which there's going to be a ton of content. We've even come up with a plan for making sure we have backup copies of the content we get. So SD cards can't be misplaced and we fuck ourselves over. So uh, smash every button on YouTube if you can. We're trying to get our numbers as high as they can be there. Speaking of social media, the uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets just posted a photo of us with Zach Wierenski and said the What Chaos Boys are live with Zach Wierenski today. So very wow. cool of the Blue Jackets. What up? Did they Shout do, let's see, did they do like, uh, who did they tag? They tagged uh, just all, both of us individually. And then they tag the show in the caption. So Blue Jackets social media team, we love you. What if we, just to like fuck with them, what if we just like <laughs> untagged ourselves? <laughs> just we, like, just, we just push the Wierenski interview tomorrow to like post it again tomorrow. We're trying to <laughs> yeah, double down. Oh, when's the Tuesday after January is not like a, a buzz in social media day. We're trying to get the most that we can out of this. Uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Winter Classic yesterday, we... I'll admit, we kind of—I I barely paid attention to the game. Yeah, it's like we were so distracted by this the stream, but the the game didn't seem all that exciting. But the the scenery was great, aesthetically looked awesome. Uh, the party looked cool. The first shutout in Winter Classic history, I believe. Yep, three yeah. nothing. Pride of AS crack and win. Yeah, I'll tell you what. What is it with the Winter Classic making goalies that were previously? Not household names. Mike Condon. Remember Mike Condon yeah, in the Winter man. Classic? He was like an emergency starter, right? I can't. Yeah. Carey Price wasn't available. I don't even know who their backup was at the time. Yeah, I don't think I don't that know. it was. Uh, what's his face from the Blues yet? Uh, I don't think he was there. That was a weird ass game. It was a weird game. Bruins didn't have it. any players. Was Marshawn was in jail. Uh, but yesterday's Winter Classic was a lot of fun. We did some psychotic ass bets mm -hmm. where we spun a wheel of all the active players and then made bets based on the players that it gave us. Two of my three bets had to be on Alex Petrangelo. <laughs> I bet the house on Alex Petrangelo blocked shots. Didn't happen. But I did get Alex Petrangelo over two and a half shots on goal. I I missed all my bets. I would have been very rich if Kyler Yamamoto scored a goal because I put $67 on him to score a goal. It would have returned like 400 bucks. Also lost a ton of money on Texas. So it was a bad betting day yesterday for me. Speaking of betting, uh, one of the one of the rules that we're putting for the chaos chain is that ten dollars is going to go on the the current chaos chain holder on the money line in every game that they play. Mm. And so we're gonna keep track of like the returns, the financial returns of the chaos chain, and it, whoever's holding. Any game that they play, ten dollars on the money line for them, regardless of the odds, and uh, we'll keep track of how many days it's been held and how much money the the holder has has returned to us as a show. Also, should note, I did get the blessing of both Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman, who, uh, as we learned live when we were announcing the chaos chain, they've been doing that for uh, for a little while. And uh, basically the exact same idea. So <laughs> we have stolen the idea, but we have gotten their, uh, their blessing. So have we explained on this episode, in case it's anybody's first time, what uh, it is? No. So winner of the winter classic holds this chaos chain. And uh, every game for the rest of the season played between them and or the team that beats them is the winner. So like they play the Kraken, hold it right now. They play the Senators on Thursday. The Kraken win, they hold on to it. If the Senators win, they take it over and then they have it until somebody knocks them off and assumes the chaos chain. And that goes for the rest of the year. We spun a wheel last week to determine who our quote unquote teams and picks are for it. I believe I had the Avalanche. You have the Avalanche. I completely forgot. Oh, I, have the the I have the Montreal Canadiens and Sean has the, uh, Montre uh, the Montreal the Pittsburgh, Penguins. The Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty uh, neat and cool. I checked, by the way, Zach Dalpe, uh, we were discussing Matt Barkowski, his college roommate, and somebody in the chat said, uh, Matt Barkowski 
is on the Penguins broadcast now. And I was mm. like, I don't think he is. I Googled it. He is. Okay. That's hilarious. That is That's, pretty It's like kind of random. Good for him. He never played for the Penguins. I don't think. Uh, might have been like. He, he played for a, like a. Might he, have been he like. He jumped around quite a bit. Yeah. Towards the end. Maybe he. But I don't know if he was ever like on the Pittsburgh Penguins. But yeah, I don't know. He's from Pennsylvania and is a hockey guy. So I hope he's killing it over there. Uh, shall we get to Zach Wierenski? Uh, I do. I just oh, pref- Blue Jackets have commented saying, don't untag yourselves. All right. <laughs> well, I was going to also say this, Blue Jackets. The only comment when I looked was uh, somebody was like, damn, my panties or something. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, my God. It was, let me see if I still nice. I don't have it up. Someone but, responded to the tweet with a, it appeared to be another podcast with a thumbs up and then said, what does this mean? Okay, then. <laughs> I don't even, I don't know what that means. Really? All right. Let's get to Zach Wierenski. Yeah. Zach Wierenski, you spent three years in high school, two years at the University of Michigan. Are you a genius or do you just hate education? Um, I think a little bit of both, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm not too smart. I, uh, I got kind of lucky with how everything worked out, but um, going to Michigan early was like the best thing that ever happened to me. So um, everything worked out. I had good tutors, good people around me, and uh, it's just kind of my, my road, I guess, to, to get here. What was it like doing the condensed, would have been senior year or whatever to like get to be able to go from junior to freshman? Yeah, it was, uh, it was weird. Like the end of my junior year, I was at USA and um, I was happy there, but I was kind of debating if I should go to the OHL. I was drafted by London. Uh, they were making a hard push. And then I went to my brother's game. He was still playing like locally, um, playing AAA for Little Caesars, and Michigan was there. And they're like, what's it going to take for you to commit here? Because I wasn't committed at the time. And we kind of just said, like, we want to come next year. And this was in, like, March maybe, April. And we kind of took a step back and we're like, all right, we'll see if we can make that happen. And then starting, you know, middle of May or June 1st or whatever it was, I had my whole senior year all summer. Um, So when I got to Michigan, I wasn't even done with high school yet. So my first week of, like, classes – I was like in the class, but I wasn't technically in the school yet. Uh, it's kind of weird. So I'd like go home, take my finals, and I had to pass them. So if I didn't pass them, I was kind of screwed. I was going yeah. to oh, probably, right? Um, and I ended up passing them, and then I got officially enrolled in the school and all that stuff. So it was kind of a crazy period, I guess. Um, but it worked out. So it's it's a common thing. Do you uh, do you have like with adults at least? Like, do you have the recurring nightmare about like it's the end of a semester and you haven't done any of the work or anything like that? Um, when I was at school, no. So like it's a th- like adults get this thing and it's I like, never have that. Really, you yeah. don't you don't have no, it? No, I'm like still to this day. Yeah. So like there's a thing like in people can Google this or whatever. Todd say Todd, do you get it? <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So there's a thing. There's a thing where you'll just have this nightmare, which is a pretty low stakes nightmare, but I guess it shows like the pressure that we feel in North America, education system, whatever, where you think it's the end of a semester and you had either stopped going to the class or you forgot to study for the whatever, and now the shit's hitting the fan. If you were a person who got that, and I'm glad that you don't because it would be treacherous given that you went to like a hundred schools at once. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think you probably have to, I say this jokingly a little bit, but kind of serious. You probably had to go to class and, and <laughs> you know what I mean, to have that nightmare. You're like, I didn't uh, stop going to class. Yeah, like, so I didn't go too much, to be honest. Um, I did my work. Like, I had good grades. I did my work, but I definitely. Um, You're a big work from home kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> I was more of a work from home, do what I had to do to get my grades where they need to be to play hockey. I was young, right? I was 17. I was living with Dylan Larkin at the time in college. Uh, we were having fun. Like, I wouldn't change how I did anything. And I'm not, whoever's listening, go to class. Um, but, you know, we had, our, we had our, a good time. And I did what I had to do to have good grades to play hockey. And uh, so maybe that's why I don't have those nightmares. What's yeah. your brand of recurring nightmare then? Uh, I don't really have nightmares. That's, I haven't had one in a long time, be to nice. be honest. Uh-huh. Um, my girlfriend always gets mad at me because I fall asleep in, like, two minutes and then I sleep perfectly through the whole night. So um, she's up all night tossing and turning, can't fall asleep. And she looks over at me and I'm just laying there. <laughs> so she always gets pretty, pretty mad at me. So I don't really have too many nightmares. It, it, this was going to be an off color joke. And I love this person. And I think you probably love this person too, but I was going to joke like recurring nightmare is torts comes back. Uh, but the <laughs> torts, uh, d- torts must have, did torts love you? 
Yeah, we had our battles, but like, I think we had a really good relationship. Um, oh. I still talk to him all the time. Whenever we play Philly in the summer, she'll call me a couple of times a summer. I'll shoot him a text, whatever it is. Um, you know, I think for me being a young guy, and I think a lot of young guys and players that have played for him probably feel the same way. It's like you, he wants the best for you and he wants you to be the best player you can be and he pushes you to get there. And when you're a young guy and you see that and you see your ceiling and, and you know, he's never satisfied with your game and he pushed me to be the best player I could be. And um, I think those were some of my, you know, best years of learning. And, and now where I'm at in terms of my game and understanding the league and everything, a lot of it's credited to him. So we, we had our battles. We had some moments where we got into it, but uh, I'm a huge sports fan. He also, I mean, for somebody who screams a lot, he also prioritizes, I think, heavily like the intangible aspect, mm -hmm. the uh, like block show, like the show that you care, do all these mm -hmm. things. And with more and more information, uh, younger generations are learning to prioritize different things as a way of like optimizing their games or anything. So like as a young player, is it helpful to have somebody who maybe goes a little too far the other way with like, it's all about <laughs> trying and effort or whatever. And you're probably thinking possibly a little more like tactically. Yeah, I think that was a struggle because like the way I play the game, like I never look like I'm really trying. Um, <laughs> I've heard that for a long time, like just how I skate and kind of how I, like how my demeanor is. It's pretty much the same the whole game. Um, I heard it in college with our coach, Red Berenson, telling me to, you know, play harder. Uh, and in my eyes, I'm playing as hard as I can. I heard that with Torts, you know, for my first few years. And that's where, that's what me and him went at it about was like, he wants you to, you know, try all the time and block all the shots and, you know, do all this stuff. And I agree with them, but mine looks different than, you know, Jonesy's did. And it looks different than what Felino did and Dubinsky. And that, those were our combos. And once we started to understand each other and what he wanted out of me and how I played the game, our relationship took off. And um, I started playing some of my some of my best hockey those years. Uh, it was like last two years with Torts. So um, definitely, I think, like you look at him in Philly right now, right? What he's getting out of that group. Like it's, they got good hockey players on that team, but no one thought they'd be second in the Metro, first in the Metro, whatever they are. And that's what he does to teams. You know, he gets the most out of guys. So like I said, I'm a huge Torts fan. And um it's great playing for him that's the best part of it for all the conjecture and everything like he's good at the job that makes yeah. it so funny because like he's gonna like quote unquote win every time when people are like how is like is this the type of coach who should be coaching these days and everything it's like as you said look what he's doing with those guys do you ever have any uh like kind of false hustle teammates because you were talking about the like your mentality and your demeanor like You've been accused of looking like you're not trying that hard when you have a teammate or anything that like is swinging their arms extra and stuff. Or you're like, I say you should wear like Fuck, a sweatshirt, knock it off, dude. wear a sweatshirt under your jersey and just be like, look how much I'm sweating. Sweat Obviously, more. I'm yeah. trying. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, no, I don't know if I've ever really thought about the false hustle. I have to look for that now. I'm sure there's guys out there that do it, but um, yeah, that's a good one. There's some guys that like work super hard and don't sweat, like you said, like you know, tell me to sweat more, but. Like Kent Johnson, for example, like last night he's got three points, probably our best player in the game. And we give him the like the hat after the game for like our best player. And he's zero sweat on his head. I'm like, <laughs> how is that possible? You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make any sense. I'm sweating in warm ups. Um, so it is it is funny how guys are just different that way. You're such an interesting case to me because you're only 26 years old, which is considered like young for most guys and kind of hitting your prime. But you've been here eight years. Uh, first season 19 and you're what like the third oldest guy on the team right now how how do you kind of grapple with that as being a young guy but also being around forever and being kind of like the steady veteran on this team yeah it's definitely different um I actually think I'm at a really good age right now because I'm close with the young guys close enough I don't you know go out with them or anything like that it's I'm at I live farther outside the city now so I don't really go out that often um but they have fun and they have their group, but I'm close enough where I feel like, um, you know, they can come to me with things and we can, you know, joke around and whatnot, but I'm also a vet. So I feel like my voice carries some weight, um, been around a long time. I think I understand the game. Well, I understand uh, a long season. Well, um, so I feel like I'm at a, a cool age where I'm kind of turning the corner to being more of a vet, but I'm also like still close with the young guys. So it's been fun this year, just kind of getting to know some of these younger guys like, you know, Fantilli and KJ, Blankenberg, all the Michigan guys. Um, I was gonna say, this is a big Michigan team. Yeah, so it's a cool age for sure. Um, 
definitely different. You know, like you said, I'm 26 and I only a couple guys are older than me. So uh, a weird dynamic for sure, but I, I like the, the spot I'm in right now. Do you feel like you've had to like be forced into growing up or you just feel like you kind of got there naturally? Um, kind of got there naturally. I mean, I was fortunate when I was young. It was like Felino, Dubinsky, Scott Hartnell, we had all these great leaders and older guys. Um, our decor, Jack Johnson, Savard, Seth Jones, you know, guys I looked up to, had a lot of fun with and kind of showed me the ropes. And then it's kind of like a period there where we were transitioning from, you know, our playoff teams, guys were on the way out, um, kind of figuring out what we were going to be. And now I kind of feel like we have an idea of what our team's going to look like the next few years. So, um, I feel like it was a pretty smooth, you know, kind of grow up for me in the NHL. Um, so it's been good so far. Those Michigan rosters are just laughable. Uh, we're a huge Zach Hyman podcast, mm -hmm. but also like Dylan Larkin, Comfer. Who was, uh, uh, Connor was there. Yeah. Like, who would you say was the most at that time mature person? Like in that group, because I assume like college athletes and everything, yeah. especially hockey, it's big, the boys energy. <laughs> was there any like adult in that group? Yeah, it was Zach Hyman. Really? Yeah, it was. Oh, it was bless he him. loves to hear yeah, that. It was for Zach sure. Hyman. He was, so he was a senior, my, mine and Dylan's freshman year. And he kind of took us under his wing a little bit. So he was great. Um, we kind of had a, a team full of the boys, you know what I mean? So in a team full of the boys, you need a guy like Zach Hyman. Um, the dad. So, yeah, so he was great for us. He still had some fun and was, just, you know, great teammate. We we, we all loved Heisey. Um, But he was kind of like the more calm one. And he was already in college for three years, so his fourth year he was kind of maybe over it a little bit. Um, but he was probably the guy my freshman year that was the more calm one. Guy, the, guy that – he was the hardest worker too, you know. Heisey worked so hard, so everyone kind of looked up to him. Was he uh, still uh, scoring his patented – three inch goals back oh, yeah. then yeah. or was he uh was he taking shots and whatnot well he kind of had a crazy college career i think his first three years his point like his career or his uh season high in points was only like 12 or something like that and then a senior year uh dylan larkin comes in has a great freshman year plays with hyman uh hyman gets uh, 40 points so it's a huge jump i was drafted by florida signs with toronto uh, as a free agent and then Based on his work ethic, you knew he was going to have success wherever he went. It just took him longer. Um, so he kind of always had that, like, knack around the net because he wasn't the most skilled guy in college. So he learned that part quickly. And then playing with Dylan, he, uh, you know, his speed and his skill started to take off a little bit and definitely not surprised at the success he's having. I mean, like I said, he's been the hardest working guy as long as I can remember. What's your best Dylan Larkin story? Because he's probably, I would guess, in that group, the one that would have the funniest stories. Yeah, he's got some good ones. Um, one of my favorite ones, um, I don't know. I mean, if I Tell should share it. this, but yes. it, was, it was our... Uh, we it was don't like, air that's this. the best yeah. start to a story. We don't know. <laughs> this podcast doesn't air anywhere. It's all fine. It's actually not even bad. It's more of like a me story, but it involves Dylan a little bit. It was our, um, it was our first coach's practice in college. And it was a Saturday. It was a football Saturday. Um, so the campus is crazy. It's like a noon practice. The game's at like three or whatever. And uh, Friday night, we all go out together. It's like whatever, welcome week or whatever it is. And um, I get home to the dorm. And the next morning, I wake up. And it's like 11.45 and practice is at noon. And I get like 50 calls from guys like, where are you? Like, you're late. Like, practice in 15 minutes. Like, everyone's calling me. So I run down to the rink. It's like 11.53 or whatever. And... No one knew I was like, because I missed warm up, but no one knew I was late at this point. So the, all the upperclassmen are like, all right, just get on the ice in time. Like, you'll be fine. So as I walk in to change, our strength coach is there, and he's like, you have to go tell the coaches you're late. It's like bad timing. So I go in there, and um, I'm like, hey, coach, like, I'm late. He's like, well, what do you mean you're late? Practice is in five minutes. Like, you're fine. And he's like, I was like, no, I was late. I missed the warm up. He's like, well, why didn't Dylan wake you up? I'm like, uh, I'm like Dylan didn't sleep in the dorm last night. Like, Dylan slept at the sophomore house. <laughs> So I thought I was getting in trouble. So coach comes in, he's like, Dylan, like start yelling at Dylan <laughs> for not waking me up. <laughs> so that's a good one I always remember that like he pretty much took the fall for me being late. You're the rat. Um, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't Bad know what teammate. to say. He's like, where was Dylan? I'm like, um, Dylan was stuck at the sophomore house last night. Like, so he was yelling at Dylan. Uh, 
pretty much saying that it's his fault that I was late. So <laughs> that's tough. That's yeah, it's a good first practice with the coaches in it, college. It, it rocked when you guys fought each other because you like you couldn't even look mad. Yeah, I was smiling on that one. <laughs> yeah, like, uh-huh. I've, that's like some like Joker shit, yeah. <laughs> like, you, like fighting and smiling and yeah. laughing. It's funny because last night Matthews, there was like a scrum, and I know Austin pretty well, and uh, I kind of had him, and he's like jokingly like, "Do you want to fight?" And I was like, "Well, I already fought Lark, so like let's let's make it a second buddy of mine, <laughs> like as a joke." Um, so we talked about that last night, but yeah, that was it's funny how that worked out. That's awesome. I've heard uh, I've heard Fantilli talk about like how nice it is to come to a locker room where there's a bunch of Michigan guys. He speaks super highly about like the alum and stuff, but like, what is the go-to, like we're going to bond over this shared experience at Michigan. Like what's the go-to thing that kind of, as soon as he walks in the room, like what are you bringing up about Michigan? Well, his brother still plays there. So I talked to him a lot about like the team. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this year was great because we were on the road during the Michigan OSU game um so we all watched that together which was fun we were in the locker room in carolina the whole team watching it we got some Ohio state fans on our team like corrali who's from here mm-hmm. um but to have like the group of michigan guys that was a good bonding experience because it's his first year in town when that game was going on um it's just a different animal here in columbus when michigan osu plays so um so that was fun obviously some stories uh we share some stories back and forth but everyone kind of has the same same experience at michigan so it's cool I want to talk about the 2015 NHL draft, your draft year, the McDavid Eichel draft year. There's obviously you only go to the draft and have that experience once. So I know you don't have any others to compare it to, but that was a bananas one. Just given all the hoopla with McDavid, how prepared are players when they're at the draft, like for the whole thing logistically, like, do you just get there and then you're like, Jesus, now do I go on? like, what's it like? Yeah, I mean, I had no idea what to expect. Um, no idea who was going to take me, obviously. Uh, kind of knew it was McDavid, Eichel, the one and two. Um, didn't know who was going to go three through the rest of the first round. Um, I had a good interview with San Jose the morning of the draft, and they picked nine. So I kind of thought in my mind that's where I was headed. Uh, I didn't really talk to Columbus at all, to be honest. Uh, I had one interview with them at the combine, and that was it. Uh, there was only like three – regional scouts in there like no no Yarmo no anything so um the the draft went seven was Provorov and then at eight I was kind of like all right probably not Columbus Ranton it was 10 Finnish guy Yarmo was Finnish I kind of just assumed maybe that was gonna uh you know be the guy they picked and then my agent was sitting in front of me and he kind of looked back at me and gave me like the head nod like right, this one's you so I then, then you get all excited and nervous and um, but yeah, you have no idea going into it. I had no no idea the the schedule, um, who was picking me, anything really. So it's kind of a whirlwind day, I guess. Kind of the saying like you black out mm-hmm. kind of applies to that situation because you're just getting pushed everywhere, and next thing you know, it's over. Um, and plus, you're so drunk the whole time. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah that's after. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask the uh, one of my favorite things about the NHL draft experience is like going out after and like players are out with their families, but like a lot of them are just wearing the Jersey that they were given and just like over the suit. Was that your experience? Like, what did you do after the draft? Yeah, ours was in Florida. So like everyone wanted to go to it. Mm -hmm. Um, So everyone flew down there, family, friends. Um, So I had a big crew down there. So after the, uh, the draft itself, I went back to the hotel and we had like a draft party kind of with like all my family, all my friends. So I I had the Jersey on for majority of the night, I think Um, just enjoying it. And then, I think we went out a little bit after, but I took the jersey off for that one. <laughs> I just think it's funny like, seeing like a table of like a family sitting down at a restaurant and it's like, clearly that kid was just drafted because yeah. he's wearing uh, whatever jersey. It's so funny. Uh, that that draft also had was just a crazy day of trade rumors. And like in the hours before the draft, some crazy trades went down. Like famously Boston dealt Hamilton, Lucic suddenly had a million first round picks in the middle of the first round. Like as a prospect, when a bunch of trades are going down and a bunch of picks are getting moved, do you start reassessing? Like, is this for me? Like, are they moving up for like, do you think about that sort of stuff? Is your agent in your ear about like, Hey, something might be happening. Um, not really, at least not for me. Like I, like I said, I really had no idea about anything. Like I never really talked to anyone about the draft. I just went, flew down there, had my interviews when I had them, showed up when I was supposed to. 
and got picked by Columbus. Like I didn't really know anything. Um, I didn't really know how the business side of the game worked. The older you get, you understand the business part of it. Um, but when you're young, you're just waiting to hear your name call. You're waiting to see who you're going to. You're waiting to play your first game. Um, they're all moments that you're excited for. And then you kind of understand there's a business side of it. Um, so when it came to the draft and all those trades and the rumors, you don't really think too much of it when you're young. Um, obviously, it was a crazy day for the Bruins, uh, making some trades. Um, but yeah, it ended up being a, a pretty good draft, that 2015 one. And then you come to Columbus. What does, I, I imagine as like a Michigan guy, you know about Columbus and college football and all that sort of stuff. But like, what does Columbus have that other NHL cities don't? It's a good question. I've uh, I've never been asked that before. Um, we can retake it and you could be like, Zach Wierenski, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> should have said that. <laughs> um, I think... I mean, other NHL cities have this, I'm sure, but like, I think just for me, what I like about it the most is just like the way of life, how easy it is. Um, it's Midwest feel. I'm from Detroit. You know, it's very similar feel here. Um, we have great fans here. I live 15 minutes outside the city and it feels like I'm, you know, far enough away, but you know, it's, there's no traffic in the mornings. It's just an easy way of life. You can go to the grocery store. No one knows who you are. Um, people don't bother you. It's it's actually a really nice place to play. And the older I get, the more I appreciate it. I hear too from guys that get traded here, uh, you know, older guys that play here, it's sign here, whatever it is, that it's you know one of their favorites, you know, places to play because of how easy of the way of life it is. Um, so, like I said, I'm sure other teams have that, but it's something I think people might take for granted. You know, they want to play in the big market, the big city, and that's great, right? It's cool. It's original six, whatever it is. Um, but for me, this is my lifestyle. It's my vibe. So I like it here a lot for that reason. Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like it, that's like often used as a criticism against Columbus and a lot of other places where it's like you don't get the shine or whatever, mm -hmm. the attention. And like it's not for everybody. So it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting to hear Nathan that Horton side of it. came here to like kind of get away from all the sort of like he, I believe, took a visit here, went to the zoo and everything and was like, I feel like I could like actually live here versus yeah. just be like Mr. Hockey crazy machine guy. For sure. And a lot of guys do live here. A lot of former players still live here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nick Flano's moving back here. Brandon Dubinsky still lives here. Fedor Tutin lives here. Rick Nash still works here and lives here. Like it's it's a great spot to to live. You know, it's a great city to live in. Uh, and a lot of people also be like, oh, like hockey players don't want the spotlight. Like you can't handle it. It's like, well, you can, but if you don't need it, why why do you want it, right? That's how I feel about it. If I don't need to play in some big market, like it'd be cool and I'd be fine handling it and I'd play hockey the same way. I just like the easy way of life, you know, being me away from the rink. Um, I live three hours from home and I think it's I think it's a great city. Yeah, there's a false equivalency there for sure. Like there are tons of big game players who would just as soon not have the spotlight and just as soon not do all the media stuff yeah, and everything. Exactly. It doesn't mean like just because you don't want all the like off the ice attention mm -hmm. does not mean that you don't want the puck on your stick or, yeah, or you couldn't handle it or something, right? Like, yeah. It's just, that's funny how that, like in the NBA, it's, you know, people always compare us to the NBA and NBA players are in the spotlight and, and yeah. NHL players don't want that. It's like, well, why would you want it? You know, I don't know personally, <laughs> like it's, it'd be sweet to play for the Rangers or the Leafs or the Bruins, you know, all these original six teams, but with that comes a lot as well. Mm -hmm. And if that's where I was, I'd be happy and I'd do it and it'd be awesome. But this is where I am now and I really like it here. Do you feel like you get that, like that criticism? Like, I mean, you mentioned that you, you've kind of been criticized for not looking like you're trying and like, do you get criticized for like not wanting the spotlight or whatever? Um, I guess I haven't really, I've been here my whole career. I haven't really mm -hmm. spoke on that, I guess. But like, I noticed Ryan O'Reilly in Toronto, like people were kind of coming at him when he signed in Nashville. At least I saw some stuff on it about like him not wanting the spotlight and the attention and kind of like, I kind of understand where he's coming from. Like go play in Nashville, a great city, great way of life. Like He's a music if, guy. He's a music guy. Also, Toronto's, like he has a Con yeah. Smythe. What is that guy afraid of? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, he's won a cup. He's yeah. got a Con Smythe. Like, I don't think it's the pressure of Toronto. that I think he just right. wanted to play somewhere else. I, like, I love Toronto and our lovely yeah. friends there, but that shit that you just said is the most Toronto thing <laughs> I've ever heard in my life yeah. of, like, a player left. 
how is it his fault? Yeah, yeah, it's like, exactly. It can be. I mean, I've talked to athletes who, who are from Toronto who left Toronto and were like, it was great to see the family a little bit and everything, yeah. but I did not enjoy that experience. Yeah. And whether it's personal pressure or outside pressure, like you don't, it's, it's not always a productive thing. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about shootouts because uh, you are on the record of absolutely loving them. You say there ne- there can't be enough shootouts. Now, you gave a post-game quote one time. It was like, <laughs> God, shootouts are stupid. I yeah. hate them. Uh, are you that firmly against them? Yeah, I think they're dumb. I think they're really dumb. I mean, like, outside of the Montreal-Pittsburgh one the other night, that went like 11 or 12 rounds. Like That was kind of exciting. But majority of them are like one goal, three saves, shootouts over, games. Done. Like It's just boring. You know what I mean? Like, I think when overtime gets going, like last night when we were in Toronto, like it was exciting. Like I had a breakaway and then I back checked a breakaway and then it's a two on one the other way. And then, you know, it's another chance the other way. And like, that's exciting to me. And that's what you want to be out there for. You want to, you know, play with your teammates, team, you know, within the team game, three versus three, try and find a way to score. It's not just, you know, a guy coming down and making a move. Like, I just don't think they're exciting for the game. What's great about three on three too, is you have a great scoring chance. And if you don't score, if this is if it's five on five and you have a great scoring chance, then the thought watching it is this team's putting a lot of pressure on. And in three on three, if you have a great scoring chance and you don't score, it's like they're fucked now. Yeah, <laughs> because it's going exactly. the other way, and it's uh, hectic. Would you change anything about the yeah, shootout? Would you change how they do overtime? Would they just just extend it or what? Yeah, I mean it's a tough question. I know they were kind of talking about like the. Kind of like the backcourt violation, like the red line or whatever it is. I don't think you can do that. Um, I think part of like the exciting factor is when a team brings it out of the zone and they get their speed and then they come at you again. There's definitely got to be like, a, I don't want to say shot clock or something, but like it's boring when teams hang on to it for two minutes, three minutes. That's no fun either. So it's almost like you extend it maybe. Um I don't know. You definitely have to extend it. Like, you can't go to a shootout. I hate shootouts. So, <laughs> would you like shootouts more if they had like a, a defender, like a cha- like a guy who chases from the other like goal? Uh, I know that's been thrown out there, yeah. but I, like as a defenseman, would you want to do that? I'd put kind of the big argument against that is that it puts guys at injury risk. Just put my head on a back check. <laughs> yeah, um, basically. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not fast enough for that. We'd have to get a faster guy. But um, I mean, something uh, honestly, whatever they come up with, I'm sure it'll be talked about to make the game better, but I'm just not a fan of shootouts. I think the excitement of like, I said, taking two guys off the ice and and making it three on three and the, how the strategy changes to win a hockey game is so much more fun than just, hey, here's a breakaway, try and score. That's my opinion, I guess. Well, maybe, maybe go two on two next and then one on one. I don't know what it is. Every five minutes, take someone off the ice and one on one, you're gonna, that's gonna be electric. Imagine that. <laughs> that would be crazy. Yeah. But something. Well, we appreciate you. Uh, Obviously, you've had a great career. We're big fans. Uh, Really appreciate you coming on with us. Yep. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Zach Wierenski, what a guy. The best. Thank you, Columbus Blue Jackets, for being in the chat, for hyping us up on Instagram and all that shit. But love Wierenski. As I said before, like, always wanted him in Boston. And if you're, I don't know, if you're any team, you want a player like that. Oh, yeah. And I... uh, I uh, one of my best friends growing up too was like an awesome hockey player who didn't swing his arms a lot, so he always got accused of like not trying. And he's like, "Well, like fuck you guys, I am trying. Like I don't know what else you want me to do." It's so weird to meet a professional athlete who's like, who like volunteers. Like, oh yeah, I get that shit. Yeah, that's so funny. I mean, he he has the chillest vibe. <laughs> like, Wierenski <laughs> has the chillest vibe, so I could see that happening. Um, do want to quickly mention, uh, shout out to the PWHL. Mm. They launched this season. Why do you only want to quickly mention them? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I was thinking we could like talk about them. They're uh, the talkie. Well, oh, this was a hockey show. I mean, we've got an hour, we're an hour show and uh. we're coming up on time. So that's uh. all I'll say. No, uh, they launched on new year's day and I love to two things that they're doing with that league. One, I mean, I feel like every time we've mentioned the PWHL, it's been like kind of negative with like the branding the jerseys kind of how they've screwed those things up. which i want to say by the way they look fine on the ice like they look fine but it's it's, they do ice well they ice well well. but there's no unique identity yeah no no, no. i mean there's still plenty of problems with it i'm just saying they were they they ended up looking being much less offensive on the ice correct yeah and and like but like the merch that they're selling is tough so it's that's been tough 
Uh, they're doing a 3-2-1 point system, which love. Been begging the NHL to do that for a while. And also, one of the things that I've wanted the NHL to do for a little bit is a like an actual penalty kill. Mm. If you score a shorthanded goal while down a man, it ends the other team's power play. They're doing that. I love that. Yeah, I like that a lot. And Sean, we were shooting the shit about this, and Sean brought up, like, does that change a team's, like, strategy on the penalty? Yeah, not, and, and, and also the kind of players that you put on your penalty kill. True, I mean, I've that's always a good been, point, yeah. Like, a lot of teams, and it's always kind of, I, like, I remember when the Bruins first had Sagan, and people were like, just, like, teach him to be a drop responsible, and he'll be such a good penalty killer because he'll have a million shorthanded opportunities. Brad Marchand and Patrice Bergeron were always so good. They're, like, the two, two of the best two-way players in the game anyway, so they're going to be really good in the penalty kill. But, yeah. like, the threat of, some of like, kind of like the three-on-three -three thing where it's, like, you better fucking score because if you don't score, this is going the other way and you're in deep doo-doo. I'd love the idea of a penalty kill just being, like, two shot blockers, two, like, lumbering idiots back there, and then, like, two speed demons. Well, I mean, like, the Carolina Hurricanes have had a power kill for a while. Like, it's, they, they you know, they have guys who move the puck really well in the back end who are also defensively responsible, and then they throw some uh, offensively talented guys who forecheck, and, like, all of a sudden, you got play going the other way. So I would love to see the NHL get into that mix. I, I don't... It's something that I, I assume that they would try out like in a preseason or something like that and see if it works. But like, I love that idea. If you give up a shorthanded goal, you don't deserve the power play. Mm. That's that's how I feel. Agreed. So I think that that would be a very cool uh, change to make. I'm glad that PWHL is running it. I also did want to mention um, the news just came out that Ryan Hartman was fined for a high stick on uh, on Cole Perfetti on New Year's Eve. And Perfetti just said uh, uh, about 40 minutes ago that Hartman flat out told him that he high sticked him in the face intentionally as payback for uh, Kirill Kaprizov getting injured uh, a day before that play. And Perfetti said, Perfetti said this uh, in an interview and also said that he was wearing a microphone in that game that caught it all. So very, very interested to see that potentially come out and to also see like if that does come out. Do you have? Do you suspend Hart? I feel like you have to. Premeditated. I feel like you have to suspend Hartman, who's been suspended or uh, been fined seven times in his career. By the way, uh, yes, you do, but I don't think I've ever seen a player get fined and then later suspended. To say, God, yeah. Well, well, why would he do that with a? My he wasn't involved. involved. My thing in is, that. what a fucking. Um, that's just like if you're gonna premeditate, so that's what I'm saying. Like, payback on somebody, like beat their ass, like get in a fight. Why are you just high sticking somebody? Like that, uh, that you're is gonna say he's a little bitch. That's kind of <laughs> that's kind of soft. To he, me. I mean, he also high sticked like the smallest guy on the ice. Yeah. Perfetti's a small guy, and he wasn't even involved in the uh, in the Kaprizov incident. So like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a player get to get fined and then kind of get more than that after the fact. In this case. I feel like you kind of have to. Yeah, but then th that seems like very 2023, though, to be like, hey, we punished a guy. You know what? Actually, with more information, we can just kind of go back and do more. I don't know. It's unprecedented. So I don't know, like, what, what should, should he be spending, like, one game? Two games? I don't know. I feel like if you intend, if you admit. We're getting to dangerously into uh, hit, hit talk, talk yeah. but but I mean, like it's it is interesting that like somebody would high stick intentionally and also tell the guy, yeah, yeah. like I'm doing with that. the hot mic though. That's the weirdest thing. Well, that's what I was gonna well, say. I don't know if he, he probably didn't know that he was mic'd oh, up. Oh, so game. wait, he was mic'd up. Perfetti was mic'd up. Oh, I thought you were saying that the uh, assailant was mic'd up. Oh, and I no, was going that to would say be, that would be that, the, yeah, stupidest the dumbest criminal yeah. in the world. Yeah, well, that, well I, what I was gonna say is like. This is not the first time that someone has gone into a game premeditated. I'm going to hurt somebody else. Well, yeah, but it's, you don't tell the guy. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> but I'm saying I just feel like if you were to like go back and suspend him, that sets like not a bad precedent, but it's just like you're never going to have people talking about it again. Like, what if they suspend him for like you, your issue with it? Just like beat his ass. You, yeah, you didn't like, even beat his ass. You're suspended five games. Give him five. I think it sends a uh, a worse message to 
be like, ah, oh, well, it's just a fine, even though he admitted he did that on purpose. Yeah, but I, I feel I, I mean, yes, I agree. I just think if they were to suspend him, it would, it would to a lot of players in the NHL would feel really like, like, come on, you know this, sh- this shit happens all the time. Like, you right. know, people come into games with premeditated, and now he's getting punished just because he admitted it. Um, but I also I agree, it's probably not good for the NHL to have guys out here publicly being like, yeah. I it would it. be very funny in like the uh, the suspension video that they do that they put out from the league if they like did mention they were like and he's a bitch. Because Furthermore, he, he could have just fought him, <laughs> yeah. but he had to be a little bitch about it. So uh, we're gonna give him I, a few games to think. Well, about and it. this is also another a whole other thing. I just thought like for the the take fighting out of the game crowd, like you're just gonna get more of this shit. You're gonna get people like I would argue that high sticking somebody is not necessarily more dangerous, but it's like. I, I guess it could be more dangerous. It's scummier. Yeah, it's scummier. Like, you're going to get more people being like, well, I guess I can't fight him, so I need to slash him in the back of the knees or whatever. Like, I I, I think there... I, all that to say there's a place for fighting in the game. I couldn't help but notice uh, Pete was very quick to change the subject away from the PWHL talk. I, I noticed that, that too. Boston, we, by the way, home debut tomorrow night. That's what I was Hillary going to Knight, ask. Captain. Do we go? Is anyone... Just, like, I feel like Sean would... Like Sean's more of a uh, I universal love, hockey fan. Yeah, than I love not hockey. Sean likes women more than I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both of us. Yeah, we. No, um, <laughs> Sean, no, like Sean is like if if someone were to come and be like, hey, do you know like this Irish hockey team? Sean would be like, oh yeah, like I, I actually mean, I, th- I like their jersey from two years ago or something. <laughs> Sean's that hockey fan, so I know that Sean's answer is yes. Here's my issue. I did not know until now because I hang around with you, so we never talk about women's hockey. Uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, you just don't talk about girls in general. Uh, yeah. You're like Jeff Skinner. You're yeah, scared. like Jeff Skinner. Gang. Uh, I didn't know that they play in Lowell. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you got to know for me, dog. I remember when that came out, and I was like, what the fuck? Like, I, I, I get that they want to play in, in like a legitimate arena, and but like if they played at Warrior or something, play, like, I assumed it was at Warrior. Yeah. There's just there was a, a lot about the PWHL where I think they clearly did not want to have a gap in there being professional women's hockey because I think they thought that was going to be like a bad look if there's like oh another league restarting, whereas like they were just like we need to have hockey this mm-hmm. year regardless of not having jerseys or branding or good that's, place to play. That's been my problem with with like this league with to the start. With the PWHL? Yes. That's, you, that's, that's you, literally what go I'm saying. On, well, yeah, what was your, my what's your problem, problem is that it feels very thrown together and like this I know that this is uh, a, a big deal but it, it this this doesn't feel like it's the the like the completed product. Yes. I, I agree with you up until you start watching the hockey. Like no, the act- I, that, that's I, I know you're not saying that, yeah, right. But like, like the, the hockey is going to be good. Like I, I think there was there was a lot of that, but like once you start actually watching the league, it's just like yeah, ah, uh, none of that shit actually matters. Well, I mean, how many companies are I mean, there matters, where it's but... like they have the right employees, like right. the infrastructure is just a little off. I would disagree that it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, because, no, no, no. I, because people I, yeah. are excited about it right it now. And you want to be ready to go at launch. Like, think about how much merch they would be selling if the teams had branding, if they had like good merch and you you don't feel like your your like expectations are kind of tempered in year one. I feel like that's a bad place to start, but I, I, I do see what you're saying in that like once the hockey starts that's what it's really yeah. about and that's that's product is going to be good i just wish that they had the pieces around it to have the legitimacy on day one totally but, and like the things that get us excited like you're uh like you love branding Pete yeah. loves right. jerseys yeah. and all that shit think of the things that we do with teams where we go to see them we meet with them we hang out with them for a little bit like we do their pro shop stuff. And I know that PWHL teams aren't going to have like big, robust pro shops with all these things. But even if we tried to do what we normally do with teams, we're not going to be getting that same sort of vibe where we're like, cool, we have green jerseys that say Boston on them. Yeah, Yeah, I just, uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely, obviously it's not perfect. I just think ultimately those problems are outweighed by, or like, it would have been much worse if there was a like full year or whatever without professional women's hockey. I think it ultimately they needed to like I think ultimately it looks put together and professional, even if like they don't have the branding. Like it clearly looks like like they're they're playing in sold out arenas. There's like the yeah, biggest stars in women hockey. So, like, and yeah. so like I think ultimately it was bigger, it was more important for them to have this league 
start now than it was for them to have all this other stuff figured out, which I, they will. Like, they, eventually they will have identities and branding and stuff. I just, uh, I, I, some, sometimes I think that, like, the, they, the women's hockey and, like, establishing a league has struggled so much yeah. over the past several years that when they kind of unified, it was seen as, like, a really, really big step for the women's game. So I, I just wanted to see them get off on a foot where it was like it was harder to delegitimize. Yeah, I, 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 I get that. I, I think I, I think, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just saying in general, I think people that Other are, people are, are at this point. This. Well, no, I just I think at this point, if you're delegitimizing, like if you don't think the product is legitimate, like you're looking at no, the product reasons. is legitimate. Like like the people that are like if you're if you're if you're the kind of person, which again, not saying you are, but if you're the kind of person that's like writing off the PWHL a hundred percent because it's like oh. I would have been watching women's hockey, but their jerseys just say Boston on the front. Like, you probably were never watching no, the PWHL correct. to begin with. Right. Uh, I get that, like, clearly there's stuff that they have to work but on. That's, you but want that's it to be kind perfect. Of, but, that's, but that goes further to my point that, like, the the women's game has struggled so much, not from a product standpoint, but from a business standpoint. Yeah. And that's sort of, like, it's it stood in the way of the women's game growing. And that's why it was frustrating to me to see them kind of running into the same same problems in yeah. that the league just doesn't have its shit together. Yeah, I think the thing that's the most confusing about it to me is just like, why did they lose all of the brands that they had in the PWH, like, like, or the PHL? Yeah, PHL? The one before. I don't remember. Like, I will say, I, also, the vibe around it is very different. Like, you're seeing so many people being like, women's hockey is here. And it's like, I mean, to be fair... It's also been here for years. Yeah. Like there have been leagues, right. but the vibe around this one feels much more like this is a little more permanent. Which yeah. I guess I at least like that. Like the players are picking up some of the slack themselves. Like uh, Kareen Schroeder, the New York goalie. Hard. Yeah, you guys. I, I still hard. haven't seen those. Hard. You have, oh, no, dude. If Sean, that's the first thing Sean said to me yesterday when we walked into the <laughs> thing. He's, you see those pads, and I was like, no, and never showed them to me. They're awesome. I mean, I'm because I'm looking at the Boston schedule, and I'm like, oh, they have a day game Saturday, January twentieth against New York. See those pads up <laughs> up close and personal. Uh, Lowell's tough though. Yeah, I know. I just I really wish that it was closer. Yeah. Lowell is uh, a shit drive. Oh yeah, I, I don't have any frame of reference. It's for... like fifty minutes probably, but <sighs> they're depending on like on... Ottawa treatment where they're the Ottawa Senators, but they don't actually play in Ottawa. Yeah, no, like Lowell is like very much not Boston. Yeah, it's like in it's a different thing. Yeah, and it's got its own energy and like charm and all this. Not my energy or charm. I know <laughs> it's a, it's like a tougher city for yeah, sure. Fair enough. Um, I've gone there for shit. I've gone there for concerts and baseball games and things like that. But mm -hmm. having to schlep there for hockey games, that's a damn. Um. Two other PWHL, PWHL points. Um, first off, I hate for this to sound like I'm one of those guys that's just being like, ah, it's it's just as good. Because obviously there's going to be a difference. So you're the, the white knight, Pete's the yeah, hater. But like, <laughs> I'm just like everybody does. I, I'm just as someone who has watched like a handful of professional women's hockey games and was watching some of the hockey yesterday, or like at least seeing highlights, like it's a pretty physical fucking game. Like I, I like I, I my the whole vibe you get from it is like oh you can't check in women's hockey it's like ah you kind of can though like it, it's a right it, that's it, like it, calling basketball soft where it's yeah. like like it's still physical yeah and also like uh I just like the 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 actual athletes are doing like so much of the like carrying yes like they are oh yeah like uh Sarah Nurse right mm -hmm. um Hillary Knight like there's there's like they are do there's a lot on them which i don't think is necessarily kind of to your point Pete. like i don't think it's fair that right there's a lot of expectation for these women to be more than hockey and players. all the questions that they've had to answer about like the business side of things yeah has yeah been that's fair. such a nightmare for them i yeah. really want to get either get on the show or make content with hillary knight and have wanted to forever she's in boston now right right she's, she's, the, she's the captain yeah okay yeah so, so that would be awesome I was saying I was like, oh, we should try to get her on the stream yesterday, um, but we didn't. All right, nice. That's the end so of that story. Who, who's the hater now? Who's the hater now? Yeah, exactly.
honestly, now I'm looking at it, like all of the women, I think all of the goalies in the PWHL were just like, these jerseys suck crazy on the pads. Really? Like nice. there's a handful of just, none as cool as the New York ones, but like a uh, goalie from Minnesota has these like sick black and purple pads. That's they, what they're playing on. That's what they're playing Wednesday. Um, the goalie for Montreal has like these sick throwback, like retro looking true pads. Like they, they put in work, the goalies. Shit. I mean, if schedules can work, we're not going to commit to it right now because we're going to look at schedules. But if schedules can work, and we go to a PHW, a P, P, W, H, another thing, the year another over thing here. they need to work on, by the, the way. The disrespect. Four letters, <laughs> four letters is too much for a league name. It's got to be three. Yeah. Or have a name. It sounds easy. Or if it's four letters, it has to be like NASA, where like you can just yeah, say it, can be it a word. instead NASA. of doing the abbreviation. Yeah, 100%. I like that. Uh, but, I mean, if we went to a game Wednesday, we got a show on Thursday, we could talk about it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we do something a little more planned, though. Anyway, back to the men. Uh, there's 13 NHL games on the schedule tonight. And I am watching, as a man, all of I them. am watching all of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What we got? Uh, the, big, the big game for me tonight is the Leafs versus the Kings, the nightcap. Uh, Leafs and Kings. I, I was shocked. You brought up this yesterday, um, like the projections or something for, what was it, winning a playoff round? And, yeah. like, the... The Kings had were at like five percent, which is in like the middle of the league. I I feel like the Kings would be one of the few teams that I would mention as like, hey, who do you got to win the cup this year? Right. So somebody asked. I did a, an AMA on Twitter a few days ago, and somebody asked like, what's your cup pick? And I just came up with the most chaotic thing I could think of, which was uh, Canucks Bruins. How funny would that be? <laughs> that would be uh, amazing. But I was just like thinking of different ones and like all of the different matchups I was thinking, like like a third of them had the Kings. Yeah. Because like they are... The Kings are built for playoff hockey. Right. They're the steady Eddie Cup contender, yeah. I would say. Out of the whole group, they're like the like safest, I yeah, would they're say. Yeah, not, they're not the sexy pick, but right. they are so good and fundamentally sound and structured like they remind me of last year's Golden Knights to a, to a little bit of an extent. Like mm. this is just a team that is built for playoff hockey. So I I was stunned that the Kings weren't up there. But like I uh, I'm excited to see them play the Leafs tonight. Uh, anytime the Leafs are involved in like a late night game, I feel like it, there's a good chance it gets a little crazy. Awesome slate tonight, by the way. Yeah. Bruins, Blue Jackets, Fantilli, uh, fighting back tears, shooting pucks into his own goal. <laughs> Bruins fan that he is. Right. Uh, Caps, Penguins, that's always good. Hurricanes, Rangers. Like a lot of good games tonight. Uh, Oilers, Flyers, revenge game. True. For, I don't even know what. Oh, no. It was no, the, Flyers beat Flyers the, beat the Sharks. Sharks. Yeah. yeah. Defending what? Eastern Conference champions versus the uh, team with the best home court or home ice advantage in all of hockey. That would be uh, Panthers and then just nobody cares. Yeah. Panthers, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Coyotes. That is a good one. Yeah, Leafs Kings should be awesome. And then Red Wings Sharks. Really, every game except for Senators Canucks is compelling. Actually, I mean, Islanders Avalanche, I don't really Senators care. Senators are like a, a compelling storyline based off what's happening there in terms of their front office. Steve Steos, now GM, mm -hmm. was named over the weekend. Yep. So uh, Blackhawks Predators. Oh, but yeah, so the 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 Senators announced some front office uh moves. Mm -hmm. I was like don't announce it on Twitter. Get to a podium, motherfucker. I know. Like, give me a press conference. And Lauer has really, uh, really announced his arrival to the party and then, like, hung out in the back room for the rest do of the party. Do you think that he is aware of the impact? That, like, do you think he knows how cool he is? Because, like, I have a feeling he doesn't realize that the people, and maybe we are just projecting our own beliefs on the rest of the world, but, like, I don't think he realizes that the people want more money than Lauer. Yeah. I'm afraid like, Does that, he know he's the face of the franchise? I don't think so. I'm afraid that, like, he came in and was really excited about owning the Senators and was like, I'm going to be actively involved. And then he did his press conference. Uh, it got, like, a ton, it gained a ton of steam, notoriety, and stuff like that. And he was not prepared to deal with, like, the attention that came from mm. him being the star at the podium. And he has, like, since decided that I'm going to hang back and just kind of be the guy behind the scenes. He didn't know his own strength. Right. He so didn't I'm, know uh, how that's powerful. That's my fear is that, like, he wasn't prepared to be the star. 
Wow. Imagine being cursed with that charisma. Right. And just being like, I thought I was the money guy. Mm -hmm. Am I like the, am I the cool guy too? <laughs> God, to be Michael Andlauer. Well, we'll be uh, talking about all these games, I'm sure, as well as the PWHL, if uh, as long as everybody's time on board. They, <laughs> if time allows. Uh, yeah, might get to that game tomorrow, though. Who knows? Uh, we will talk to you on Wednesday, though. Toodaloo. Bye. <laughs> We all silly like the mayor. 